Now, our account in John chapter 11 began, John chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord Jesus Christ is preaching in the region of Batanea, beyond the Jordan, which is about 90 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's about a four-day walk. In John chapter 11, verse 3, he receives word that Lazarus, the brother of Mary, and Martha is critically ill. He's on his deathbed in Bethany near Jerusalem. Now, John records here that Jesus loves Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And so in love for them, for their good, Jesus waits until he knows in his omniscience that Lazarus has died before he makes the four-day journey by foot to Bethany. So despite the great danger evidenced by threats from those in nearby Jerusalem, and in perfect obedience to the revealed will of the Father who sent him, the Lord then arrives in Bethany with his disciples in verse 17 after Lazarus has been dead and in the tomb for four days. Decomposition has set in. There's a stench of death filling the tomb. No silly superstition about a hovering soul is going to cast doubt on the miracle that's about to take place. He arrives in Bethany, and he speaks first with Martha, and then with Mary, and then with the mourners who follow her out. He groans within himself in verse 33. Righteous indignation in response to unbelief, in response to weak faith, in response to the ravages of sin and death, and the sorrow that always accompanies them. And so then he comes to the tomb to face his enemy, death itself. He commands those standing by to roll away the stone, and he prays to the Father, bearing witness that he's been sent by God into the world, and then, with a loud voice, he calls Lazarus forth from the dead. Lazarus, come forth. So Lazarus hobbles out, bound in his grave clothes. Now, this miracle in John chapter 11 is undeniable. Those for Jesus and those against Jesus all attest to it. Verse 45 ends with many believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. I want you to consider with me now, as we get into our text today, the purpose for which Jesus Christ has raised Lazarus from the dead, and consequently, the purpose for which this miracle is recorded in our Bibles. Now, that purpose is stated for us by the Lord himself in verse 4. He says there, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. As we work through our text today, I want to be sensitive to that purpose. Considering the Lord's purpose here, I want to take some time in the beginning to set up the main point of the verses that we are blessed to study together this morning, namely John 11, verses 46 through 57. So now follow along as we go through this. Think. Think as we go. Engage with the text. Good expository listening, okay? Ask the Spirit of God to renew your mind, to reveal the glory of God from this text, as it is his purpose to do that. Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead to reveal the glory of God and so that the Son of God would be glorified in it. That's why after this point, we don't hear much more from Lazarus. We don't hear much about what Lazarus felt, what he thought. We don't know what was going on with him much after this point, and we don't know what was going through his mind when he faced death a second time. That's because here in John 11, this story is not ultimately about Lazarus. It's not ultimately about Martha. It's not ultimately about Mary or the mourners or the murderous Jews who have come out of Jerusalem. This story is about the greatness and glory of Almighty God going forth and conquering in His Son, our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now think about it. How is then God glorified in the raising of Lazarus? How is the Son of God glorified through it? In what way in this text is God's glory revealed to us? Now think about what's going on here for a moment. God's glory is revealed in raising Lazarus from the dead because raising Lazarus from the dead demonstrates God's power. Who in the world has power to raise the dead? No one but God. 
And we are to stand in awe at the power of God. And in that, God is glorified, right? When you see God's power displayed and you stand in awe of the power of God to raise the dead, God is glorified in that. Now, raising Lazarus from the dead also demonstrates the Lord's authority over life and death itself. Jesus here, if you think about it, Jesus didn't have to shout with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He is the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ could have raised Lazarus from the dead without a word. In infinite power, he shouts with a loud voice in verse 43 to communicate to us his supreme authority over life and death. And in that supreme authority over life and, life and death, God is glorified. We see his glory, don't we? We see his glory revealed. The one who has power. The one who has authority over life and death itself. Now this account in John chapter 11 of Jesus Christ raising Lazarus from the dead also demonstrates his omniscience, his knowledge of all things. It demonstrates his sovereignty, his all-encompassing and dominating rule and reign over all things. Raising Lazarus from the dead demonstrates his goodness, doesn't it? His compassion, his love. It's depicted here in John 11. It depicts his, his benevolence, his kindness, his grace, his mercy. But think about it. The necessity of raising Lazarus after sickness and death, doesn't it also reveal his justice? Reveal his holiness? But ultimately here, raising Lazarus from the dead reveals God's glory and the glory of the Son through his progressing work of redemption. He is saving people from their sins. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so all this is a picture of the redemptive work of God in Christ. In all of this, God is glorified. God's glory is revealed. And we are to stand in awe of that. We're to look at this and revel in the glory of God. God's nature, God's character is displayed in these many and varied ways in this one event in John chapter 11 of Christ raising Lazarus from the dead. The glory of God is revealed. Our response shouldn't only be to stand in awe of that glory, but our response should also be to believe. Jesus says down in verse 14, he says this, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. So that you may believe. We're to stand in awe of God, but we're to, be to believe in him, to trust him, to follow him. So as we work through John 11 here, though, I want you to think about another way, another way in which God's glory is revealed here. And it's another way in which God's glory is revealed throughout the Bible. I would submit to you it's another way in which God's glory is revealed in the lives of his people. It's a way in which God glorifies himself. And it's this. God's nature, God's character, his power, his authority, his omniscience, his sovereignty, his grace, his justice, his holiness, and so on. All that, all that which reveals his glory is not only displayed here in raising Lazarus from the dead, but it's also displayed in God's victory over his enemies. Jim Hamilton calls it God's glory revealed in salvation through judgment. Raising Lazarus from the dead reveals the glory of God and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in his victory over death. Christ conquers death. His glory is revealed in his victory over his enemies. Every enemy will be put in subjection under the boot of Christ. It is, he's glorified in his victory over man's sin and rebellion. Although man's wickedness is great, man's, it appears to us that man's wickedness cannot reach a higher watermark. It is so prevalent it is so wicked, so overwhelming, but God conquers the flesh. God conquers sin and death. He conquers over man's sin and rebellion. Our God is a conquering, victorious God. 
He reigns supreme. All his plans for his people to glorify himself will come to pass. And in that, think about that now for a moment, in God's victory, in his going forth and conquering, God is glorified, isn't he? And we are to be in awe of that glory, and we are to believe and trust in him and to follow him. Here's another way to think about it. God's glory is not only revealed in giving grace to the humble, but what? But also in casting down the proud. Think about that for a moment. God's glory is revealed in his victory over all who oppose him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 24, turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 24, Paul says it this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 24. When the end comes, he, that's Christ, Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end, think about God's victory, he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Verse 25, for he, Christ, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed, verse 26, is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, when God is ultimately, fully, and finally victorious over his enemies, then the Son, verse 28 himself, will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. God is glorified in triumph. God is glorified in victory. God is invincible. God is undeterred. God is unassailable, unstoppable. And in that, God is glorified. Daniel said in chapter 4, verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Our God conquers. Listen to this from Isaiah chapter 46, beginning in verse 8. Remember this, the prophet says, and show yourselves men. Recall to mind, Isaiah says, O you transgressors, remember the former things of old. He calls them to remember his greatness. He calls them to remember his many victories on their behalf. He says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, God says, I have spoken it, and I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. He says, listen to me, you stubborn hearted who are far from righteousness. Listen, I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Our God conquers. Our God is victorious. And he's victorious in every way, doing all his will. Now let's heed the words of Isaiah here. and Let's remember some of those former things of old. Remember the Israelites in bondage. They're in bondage in Egypt under the oppression of Pharaoh, where by strength of his hand, God brings them out. Right? And they're standing at the bank of the Red Sea. If you remember the story, the Egyptians are closing in from behind. And Moses says this to them in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. He says, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. See the glory of God in his victory. He says, 
see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. And he doesn't merely save the Israelites, he judges the Egyptians. He says, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. God wipes out his enemies. God is victorious and fully and finally victorious. God conquers. Paul says this of that account in Romans chapter 9. Paul says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that I might show my glory in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. In other words, I was victorious over you, Pharaoh, so that I would be glorified. That's what God is saying here. Our God reigns. Remember the story of the Israelites when they're in the wilderness now, and they're about to come to the edge of the promised land, and they refuse to go in. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 14. Let's take another look at an example of this. Numbers chapter 14. God's glory revealed in salvation through triumph. In salvation through judgment. Revealed in salvation through victory. In Numbers chapter 14, look down beginning at verse 11. So now the Lord is dealing with a rebellious and stiff-necked people, the children of Israel. Moses is leading them. And so the Lord in verse 11 said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? Now listen, even the children of Israel, when they reject the Lord, the Lord will see to it that he's victorious even over them. The Lord's plans will not be thwarted by a stubborn and stiff-necked people. God will accomplish his plans. God will fulfill his promises. The work of God will be done, regardless here of the disobedience of the Israelites. He says in verse 12, in judgment, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of you a nation greater and wider than they. But Moses intercedes, verse 13, and he says to the Lord, Listen, then the Egyptians are going to hear it, right? For by your might, you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among the people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. You see what they're accusing God of? God's not powerful enough. God's not able. You know, we see the failure of the Israelites, don't we, in the Old Testament. Failure after failure after failure after failure after failure. So what does our victorious and conquering God do? He makes a new and better covenant in which he says, I'll take my law. I will write it on your heart. I will, God says, write it on your hearts. I will cleanse you from all your idols. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. I will put a new heart within you. Take that heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will give you my spirit and I will cause you to keep my judgments and do them. Why? Because he is a conquering, victorious God. God does that. He says, not for their sakes do I do this. God says, but for my holy name's sake, because I will be hallowed in the eyes of my people. Look here at Numbers 14, verse 17. Moses said, now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon, Moses says in verse 19, the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even till now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. 
But truly as I live, God says, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt in the wilderness and have put me to test now these ten times have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers. Now listen, the Lord promises my glory. Habakkuk says it this way, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This earth will be filled with the glory of God. And here, those that tested God, that grumbled and complained against Him, that disobeyed Him, that rejected Him, that rebelled against Him in the wilderness, all of them died there. And He swore in His wrath that they would never see His rest. They're not going to live under the glory of God in heaven. They're going to live under the glory of God for all eternity in judgment. God will be glorified. So He wipes them out, except for, in verse 24, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Our, glory, our God glorifies himself through victory, through triumph, through the salvation of his people, through the accomplishment of his plans, through the fulfillment of his promises, through victory, through conquering, through judgment. If you remember, God promising to restore Israel from exile in Ezekiel chapter 20, beginning in verse 33, listen to the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. God glorifies himself in being victorious over his enemies. He glorifies himself in saving his people at the same time that he triumphs over their enemies. Our God conquers, and in that, he is glorified. Our God, doesn't the Bible describe him as a consuming fire? right? Devouring the adversaries. God is glorified in bringing about the triumph of his will. He is El Gabor. He is mighty God. Listen to Isaiah chapter 63. Listen to this. I who speak in righteousness am mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? God says here, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance, God says, is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. And men think they're strong. No, one, no one's strength compares to God's. The glory of God is revealed in the salvation of his people through victory over his enemies. Are you getting the idea with this? This is a major theme throughout the Bible. It's all over the Bible. One more example. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Let's look at a, a consummating victory here. Revelation chapter 18 that is yet future. Again, God conquering over his enemies. The glory of God revealed in the salvation of his people through victory over his enemies, through triumph. Look at Revelation 18 and look down at verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. This is the destruction of the whore of Babylon. 
Verse 22, the sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. His victory is total. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of bridegroom and bride shall, be, shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. God will glorify himself in saving his people through judgment of those that are on this earth that oppose him. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, what's the response of God's people to this? After these things, John says, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. Can you see the, the glory and honor ascribed to God in his victory over sinful, wicked people? And God's people praising the Lord for it shouting hallelujah, Babylon has fallen, these people are killed, they're wiped out, and God's people say amen. Because God will be glorified. The holiness and justice of God vindicated in his victory over his enemies. He says, verse 3, again they said hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and they worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters. And as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Listen, there's, there's some in this room who will be on one side of this victory one side of this conquering. And there are others of you here today who will be on the other side of that victory, on the other side of that conquering. Whose side are you on? Our God conquers. Our God is victorious. Our God will rule and reign. And listen, if you reject Christ, if you rebel against him, Right, the, the heart of a believer today bleeds for you, pleads with you to turn to Christ, to live for him, to give your heart to him, to serve him faithfully and fervently all the days of your life. But listen, if you rebel against him, if you reject him, then in your judgment, when you are cast into hell, where the smoke rises forever and ever, God's people will say amen. And they will give him glory for your judgment. Listen to me, you son, you daughter. If you don't follow the faith of your parents and put your trust and faith in Christ, then your parents will be in heaven one day looking upon your judgment with nothing else to say, enraptured with the glory of God and agreeing with his vindication. They'll be saying of you and your judgment, Amen. Praise God. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how, how my heart will get there because I, I want my kids to be saved. But God says that it'll be so. And you'll agree You'll agree with that judgment when it comes because God will be hallowed in your eyes. He is a holy God. He is to be worshipped. He is to be praised. And he will be victorious. God is invincible. The chief example of this theme that runs throughout the Bible is seen in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said at Pentecost, 
He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him, listen, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. You've put him to death. The one whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Peter later says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Of how much fierce judgment are those counted worthy who have crucified the Lord of, God, of glory? But of how much fierce judgment are those counted worthy who trample the blood of Christ underfoot and count the blood of the covenant a common thing and reject the Lord? In his death and in his resurrection, Christ conquers all his enemies and ours. As Spurgeon says, Jesus Christ is the true champion of the church. His glory is revealed in the salvation of his people through judgment, the salvation of his people through triumph, through victory. And it's that kind of glory that is revealed beautifully in our text today in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. God is invincible. His plans are unstoppable. No matter how many plots and schemes and enemies come against him, he will be victorious. In John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45, in the face of enemies breathing out threats against Christ from Jerusalem, the Lord boldly makes his way to Bethany. And the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in Bethany in his victory over the grave, in his victory over death. He is glorified in the resurrection of Lazarus. But now as we come to verses 46 through 57, at the conclusion of this account, God directs our thoughts forward. This is a foreshadowing, if, foreshadowing, if you will. He directs our thoughts forward to not a resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, but the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And we see this revelation of his glory in these verses in progress, as it were. We get to look behind the curtain, so to speak, of God's providence. He is bringing about the revelation of his glory here through the salvation of his people in the greatest of all victories over his enemies, the substitutionary death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we begin, I want you to see our text opens up with a very important contrast between verses 45 and 46. And this contrast sets the tone for our passage, all right? Upon the Lord raising Lazarus from the dead, verse 45 says this, many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things Jesus did, believed in him, all right? That response of people seeing the glory of God revealed in this miracle and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ that response is then contrasted in verse 46. It begins with the word, but, all right? Those believed in him, but, verse 46. Some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Now, Jesus' words, Jesus' works, often cause a division between the Jews. Often cause division, we've seen that. And you could hope that these that ran off to the Pharisees, you might hope that they're running off rejoicing in what Jesus had done, to tell them the wondrous news that Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. But the contrast, the contrast set up in verse 46 with that word but points to a motivation of malice. They're not rejoicing here. They're going to tattle on him <laughs> with the chief priests and scribes and Pharisees in Jerusalem. So when vo verse 46 comes, the enemies of the Lord now are arraying themselves against the Lord. The enemies of the Lord are embattling themselves against him. To the casual observer, it might appear to us as we look at this text that with all the opposition continuously working against the Lord, that Christianity isn't going to make it, right? 
that Christianity is destined for a devastating failure. The Lord has very few actual followers. There's great opposition continuously against him. The people and leadership are out to kill him, and at every turn he is accused and embattled. But this is a text from verses 46 through 57 that is about the Lord's victory. It is about the Lord revealing his glory in victory. No matter how things appear to be going, God is in control, and God is bringing about his victory over his enemies. No matter how wicked men plot and scheme against him, God will turn those plots and plans over on their heads to reveal his glory in victory. Now that glory is revealed in victory, one, over judgment. He is victorious in judgment. Two, we'll see that he is victorious in salvation. And three, that he is victorious in time. <laughs> he is victorious in judgment, victorious in salvation, and victorious in time. First, he is victorious in judgment over his enemies. Look at verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. So now the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ gather themselves together against him in verse 47. Sounds like a psalm to me, doesn't it? Right? Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now here, what does the Lord do? What does the Lord do? What does the Lord do in Psalm chapter 2? He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision, and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. God reigns. God is victorious. So nevertheless, now in verse 47, follow me with this. The chief priests and the Pharisees take counsel together, just like Psalm 2. They don't have the authority to take any judicial action by themselves. They needed the approval of the ruling body, which is the Sanhedrin at the time. And so they call together a council of the Sanhedrin and they express their distress with the plotting of a vain thing. The question they ask in verse 47 is literally, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? In other words, listen, we're not getting anywhere. This man is doing many signs. So far, their plots have been a vain thing. They've attempted to trap him in his words and they've been publicly embarrassed by his answers. They've attempted to discredit him as a madman or discredit him as a demon, demon-possessed. But he has done many works, undeniable works that only God can do. And so they've had it with Jesus. They're exasperated. What are we doing here? We're not getting anywhere. We're not making any progress. They're not effectively dealing with Jesus. So what is God doing here? God is holding them in derision, isn't he? <laughs> what does the word derision mean? Derision means a, a contemptuous mockery. That's why it's he who sits in the heaven. It's why he laughs. It's a contemptible mockery, a contemptuous mockery. They're doing all they can to get rid of Jesus and God, who is victorious, just sits in the heavens and laughs, holding them in derision. God is bringing about victory, salvation for his people through their judgment. And if you look at verse 48, you see a foreshadowing of their judgment. They say, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. If we let him keep going like this, everyone's going to follow him. In other words, he's going to be the leader, and we lose. That's what they're saying. Now consider for a moment, in verse 48, they're hanging themselves with their own rope. One, they all acknowledge freely that he is actually working miracles. They don't doubt that. It's not in question. The Lord Jesus Christ is performing miracles. But, secondly, no official charge is made against him. They don't bring an official charge. They just want to gather the Sanhedrin together, get a council together to determine what are we going to do about this guy? This guy is getting followers and we don't like it. They're going to follow him. They're not going to follow us. 
So far, three, everything they've attempted to do to stop him has utterly failed. And four, they admit, they acknowledge, he's so compelling and believable that if he keeps going like this, everybody's going to believe him. Everybody's going to follow him. They say that in verse 48. So now, think about those things for a moment. In light of this, do these wicked men stop to reconsider their course of action? Do they think to themselves, wait a minute, we may be on the wrong side of this thing. We may not have this right in our heads. Does scripture here ever come up? No. Does God ever come up? No. This is blind and irrational unbelief. They are committed against God. They are committed to destroying him and destroying his work. So why are they so threatened by Jesus? What is it that they're so afraid to give up? The answer is given in verse 48, where they say the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. Richard Phillips says here, it's all about policy, all about politics, power, and position. No place was given here for the truth. The goal of gathering this council together is not to find the truth. The goal of this council is to get rid of Jesus. They don't care about the truth. They're not concerned with the truth. They're concerned about survival. Essentially, these men were struck with an insane fear. And their insane fear was over what they might lose if they actually followed Christ and believed him. What they might lose if others followed Christ and believed him. I was witnessing to a man once. I was a witnessing to him. He stopped the conversation short. Just stopped the conversation because he was afraid I might change his mind. How irrational is that? You can't be persuaded with the truth of God. He didn't want to change his mind. He didn't want to give anything up to follow Christ. He was fearful that it might change his mind. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19? I'll give this example to the folks at the funeral yesterday. I want to make sure that everyone else hears it also. also. Rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Rich young ruler came to Jesus asking, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? You remember? Jesus told him, if you want to enter into life, keep my commandments. So what does the rich young ruler say back to Jesus? All these things, he says, I've kept from my youth. What do I lack? So Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, Jesus says, and follow me. What does the rich young ruler do then? Rather than giving it up, the young man, it says, went away sorrowful because he had great possession, possessions. John chapter 11, they don't want to give up their place. They don't want to give up their power. They don't want to give up their prestige. They don't want to give up their pride. They don't want to give up their leadership. They don't want to give anything up. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They don't want to follow him. This reality stands for us as a test of true faith versus a fake, false, or counterfeit faith. Do you have a genuine, living, and saving faith, or do you have a spurious, false, and damning counterfeit faith? Ask yourself the question. Do you respond to the demands of following Christ like the Pharisees in John chapter 11, worried about what you might lose? Do you respond like the rich young ruler with Christ in Matthew chapter 19, not wanting to give it all up to follow Christ? It's a test of your faith. I asked a question yesterday. Which do you think is easier? To make a fortune or to give a fortune all away? Now, making a fortune is hard work. It's going to take labor, effort. It can take years to build wealth, right? To make a fortune. It's going to be hard work. What's easier than simply giving it all away? What's easier than that? Unless you love it. Unless you love it unless you love the wealth. The rich young ruler loved his wealth more than Christ, and so he wouldn't give it up. I'd submit to you those scribes, those Pharisees, the people in Jerusalem, 
loved their position, loved their place, loved their false religion more than Christ and would not give it up. Now think of your faith in Christ in the same way. Many today, maybe you, find it so easy to say, I believe in Christ. You find it so easy to say that I want to trust him, that he's my treasure, that I love the Lord. So easy to say. They find it so easy to say that they've turned from their sin and now trust Christ alone until they're faced with giving something up. Something they actually, by their actions, prove that they love more than Christ. Maybe for you this morning, it's drugs. Won't give it up to follow Christ. It's because you love drugs more than Christ. Maybe for you, it's alcohol. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe you're unwilling to give up your pride to go and ask someone for forgiveness that you know you've wronged. Maybe you're not willing to give up some of your comfort to go and bear witness for Christ in evangelism. Now think about it for a moment. What are you not willing to give up for Christ? Maybe you're not willing to give up being right all the time with your spouse. Maybe you're not willing to give up a little sleep to study God's word. What is it that by your actions you prove that you love that more than Christ? It's a test of your faith. Kids. Kids. Maybe you're not willing to give up some of your leisure, some of your playtime, some of your video games, some of your TV some of your leisure time, to seek salvation from God. Ladies, maybe you're not willing to give up your will in order to submit to your husband, as the Bible commands you to do. You show a love and devotion to those worthless things more than a love and devotion to Christ. Now what does that say about your faith? With these faithless Pharisees in John chapter 11, verse 48, God showed himself to be victorious in their judgment. God showed himself to be victorious in their judgment. It was a short time later, after this account in John 11, that in AD 70, they did in fact lose their place and lose their nation. They rejected their Messiah, and so God's judgment fell by the hands of the Romans. Jerusalem was overrun. The temple was destroyed, the people were scattered, and many of those Jews perished at that time in hell forever. What about you? What about you? Easy to say, right? But is your faith genuine? Will you give up everything to follow Christ? Do it right now. Give up everything to follow Christ. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3. What things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and the glory of his victory, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. God is victorious and God will be victor over you in judgment if you're not in Christ. How much better, right, to be in Christ in victory. Amen? Back in John chapter 11, we also see that God here is victorious in salvation. God is victorious in judgment, and God is victorious in salvation. Verse 49 says this, One of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, after their little 
despairing diatribe in verses 47 and 48, the Romans are going to come. They're going to take away our place, our nation. Everybody's going to believe in Christ. Caiaphas said to them, you don't know anything. You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider, verse 50, that it is better, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this, verse 51, he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now get this, all right? This is an example of the awesome sovereignty of a conquering God. In verse 47 and verse 48, chief priests and the Pharisees are fearful. They say everyone is going to believe in him if he keeps going. The Romans are going to take away our place in our nation. So in verse 49, Caiaphas says, you don't know what you're talking about. All right? Now, in great irony here, it's actually Caiaphas that has no idea what he's talking about. He has no idea what is actually coming out of his mouth, okay? He makes a statement in verse 50, and he means one thing by a statement. But we know from verse 51 that God has ordained those very words to come out of his mouth, and for God, they mean something entirely different. Now let that sink in for a moment. God is victorious in saving his people. God is, and nothing will get in God's way. God even uses the words out of this wicked man's mouth to prophesy of his victory. This is a beautiful example of the truth that Joseph expressed to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph said to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, right, when they put him in the hole and sold him into slavery. But God, what did he say? God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Here in John 11, Caiaphas spoke his own mind. Caiaphas gave his own opinions. Caiaphas used his own vocabulary. On his part, Caiaphas had his own motivation. He was calloused. He was calculating. He was murderous. He exposed his own heart. And he sinned here. He sinned in furthering the plot to murder Jesus. But while Caiaphas was speaking, God was also speaking. And although they used exactly the same words, they weren't saying the same thing. It's amazing to me. This is astounding, right? You can't stop God. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Now, God's power is at work here. It's at work to overturn everything that Caiaphas is saying. And according to verse 51, God uses Caiaphas' own words to prophesy God's victory. Caiaphas' words with God's meaning. Do you see? Now, it goes to show you that God doesn't merely use a bad circumstance and turn it around for good, but God is sovereignly powerfully at work in all circumstances to bring about his good in every way. God is sovereignly at work in all things. He is sovereignly at work in history, governing circumstances, from the very start to work for good. Now that's power. That's sovereignty. God is revealing his glory in sovereignly working to save his people through victory over all those who think that they're working in opposition to him, when in actuality, they're just working to bring about his glory for him. <laughs> Caiaphas rebu rebukes the Pharisees for their despairing statements in verses 47 and 48. And then he, being the wicked compromiser that he is, he gives an answer to their dilemma, right? He says, we're going to kill him. He's going to be our scapegoat. He will die so that the nation won't. We're going to murder Jesus so that the Romans don't come along and murder us. Jesus is going to be our substitute. That's essentially what Caiaphas is saying. So in verse 53 then, from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. This was the council's decision. And soon, putting Jesus to death, they didn't ensure their safety. In fact, they ensured their destruction. You cannot stand in opposition to God. 
you here today, if you've not given all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength to following Christ, you can't stand in opposition to God. He will be victorious. Bow your knee. Confess him as Lord to the glory of God the Father and live for him. Here in John chapter 11, verses 51 and 52, John explains here there's much more to Caiaphas' statement. He didn't say this of his own accord. He prophesied. In other words, he revealed a word from God. When this wicked man communicated his wicked solution, God, at the same time, communicates the greatest solution to the problem of man. Caiaphas' words brought about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The decision of the council brought about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was just as God from the beginning had intended it. Peter says it this way in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. God didn't merely turn a horrible situation good. God was there from eternity past for loving his own, even to death, death of the cross, decreeing their deliverance through his own victory over sin and sinful men for his glory and their good. Now this is what God said. We know what Caiaphas said, but with his words, here's what God said. It is better for you. It is better for me that one man should die for the people, for the people of God, that one man should die. It's better that he would die, not that the whole nation, the people of God, it's better for him to die than that the whole nation would die. The Jews determined to kill Jesus so that the Romans wouldn't come along and kill them. God said, I have determined to kill my only begotten son, the eternal son of God, so that I don't have to kill you. And God substitutes Jesus for you. From Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. He was smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led away as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, God says, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Listen to this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and to put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. According to the predetermined and inviolable and unassailable plan of Almighty God, Jesus Christ is ordained to die for the ungodly. It's substitution. It's a vicarious death because Jesus Christ dies in the place of sinners, in their place and for their benefit. We describe his death as sacrificial 
because he bears our punishment. It's by his stripes that we are healed. And what an indictment it is against our own hearts that we don't take our sin more seriously. Right? Well, let's make our point here from this. Nothing stops God. He who gave up his only son is anything going to stop God? Nothing stays his hand. He accomplishes all his good pleasure. He is victorious in the salvation of his people. These wicked men didn't stop him. We wicked men didn't stop him. One commentator said this, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice in our stead bearing our sin in his own body on the tree. He suffered not only awful physical anguish, but he also suffered the unthinkable spiritual horror of becoming identified with a sin to which he was infinitely opposed. He thereby came under the curse of sin, so that for a time even his perfect fellowship with his Father was broken. Thus God proclaimed his infinite abhorrence of sin by being willing himself to suffer all that in the place of the guilty ones, in order that he might justly forgive. Thus, the love of God found its perfect fulfillment, because he did not hold back from even that utmost sacrifice, in order that we might be saved from eternal death through what he endured. He is victorious. He goes out and conquers to save his people through victory, through triumph. Praise God, right? Now, others would undermine that victory. Others would come in and try to take the knees right out from under. They would diminish his glory. They would say that Jesus Christ died a sacrificial death for all. That he substituted himself for all sinners. And because many reject him, and they die, and they go to hell, there are many, ultimately, that he is powerless to save. He doesn't triumph for them. He isn't victorious for them. But now, is that what the Bible teaches? No. God's victory, is God's victory dependent upon human choice? No. God triumphs. God conquers. Look at verse 52. He died, not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. He died so that one day in fulfillment of God's promise, like Romans 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 26 says, so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. But also the Lord Jesus Christ in his substitutionary, vicarious, sacrificial death gathers together in one who? Everyone? No. He gathers together the children of God. Now, from the Gospel of John so far, who do we understand these children to be? Who are the children of God? Well, all those in John chapter 1, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. All those who in John chapter 3, verse 3, who have been born again by the Spirit of God, brought to saving faith, after the regenerating work of the Spirit of God, making them alive from the dead in Christ. The children of God include all those in John chapter 6, verse 44, who have been drawn by the Father. They include all those in John chapter 6, verse 65, to whom it has been granted to come to the Father. From John chapter 10, verse 16, these are those for whom Christ died that include other sheep that are not of this fold, Israel. All those that God has collectively elected and drawn to himself, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world. Written there by God, who didn't merely look down the corridor of time and react to what he saw there, but they were written there by God, who wrote history and ordains all things that come to pass for his victorious glory. Do you see how Arminianism and you see how that theology undermines the glory of God in his victory in accomplishing salvation for his people. God is victorious in salvation. It is a victory that will not be denied. And it is not undermined or thwarted or changed by human choice. Now what does that tell us? 
One, be strong and courageous in Christ. Be strong against sin. God has said, our conquering victorious God, God has said, it will not have dominion over you. Be courageous and bold in difficulty. God is not simply turning a bad circumstance around for good. God is there from the beginning in that circumstance, in that circumstance ordaining it for good. In evangelism, be bold, be very courageous, be strong. It is God who accomplishes all things that pertain to his good pleasure, including the salvation of that sinner you're standing in front of. Be bold for Christ. Our confidence in Christ, considering that God conquers, that God is victorious in all things, our confidence in Christ should be through the roof. Is he going to conquer your sin if you're in Christ? Yes. Now turn from your sin and get to work. Is he going to be victorious over your flesh? Yes. He is a conquering king. Now serve him. Stop paddling your boat over the sides with your own hands trying to get your boat to move. Put your sail up into the means of grace that God has appointed and let the Spirit of God blow your boat forward, right? Our God will have his glory in accomplishing his ends in you, in conforming you to Christ, in producing in you the fruit of good works, which God has prepared beforehand that you're going to walk in them. Put your sail up and get to work. We can boast in our infirmities because our God is strong and mighty and powerful and he conquers. I can boast in the invincible, inviolable, victorious cross of Christ. Spurgeon said this of our victorious Lord. We must by importunate prayer, opportunistic prayer if you will, call him to our conflict. For like the Greeks without Achilles, we are soon overcome by our enemies, and we are but dead men if Jesus be not in our midst. But why, if you claim Christ, and our God conquers and reigns and is victorious, why would you do anything apart from him? And yet we do that all the time, don't we? We're so weak in our flesh. We're so forgetful. We don't trust him. We don't depend upon his strength. Corey ten Boom said, look at the world, you'll be distressed. Look within, you'll be depressed. Look to Christ and you'll be at rest. <laughs> From Romans 8, beginning in verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God and the victory of God, and the grace of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love Christ more. He didn't merely offer you salvation. He conquered for you. He conquered for you. He conquered to save you. God is victorious in judgment. He's victorious in salvation. Lastly, he's victorious in his time, in his timing, in his perfect timing. Verse 53 from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but he went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there he remained with his disciples. Jesus knows how hostile they've become, but his hour has not yet come. So he leaves for Ephraim near the wilderness. Verse 55, the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. The Passover here, is when Jesus is finally taken and crucified. It's just a short time away. We're nearing his death. Now, the people were gathering together for Passover, and they were purifying themselves. It was a ritual purification that took place before the celebration of Passover. And think about it. They're purifying themselves before the greatest defilement imaginable, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Messianic expectations are high, and because of that, everybody knows about Jesus. His name is going out. People know about Jesus. And so because messianic expectations are high, he's on their thoughts. He's on their lips as they talk about him. So in verse 56, they sought Jesus. They spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? You think he won't come to the feast? 
Verse 57, now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. All of this pointing forward to the greatest triumph of all at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get there. And the scripture is glorious, right? The Lord Jesus Christ, glorious in his victory, glorious in his triumph, glorious in his judgment over his enemies, but glorious, right, in the salvation of his people. I'd submit to you that is a full and glorious and triumphing and conquering salvation. So live boldly for Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you have conquered because we can't. We're so grateful, God, that you've made provision for our sin because we are sinners, hopeless and destitute apart from you. God, we praise you for your victory over sin and your victory over the grave. We praise you for your victory in bringing salvation to your people. And we praise you and thank you, Lord, that you are a conquering God. And that the Lord Jesus Christ goes out to conquer. We praise you, God, for this glorious salvation. I pray, God, that in light of that astounding reality, that there would be no one here that would keep themselves in the fool's way of denying that victory and rejecting Christ to live for themselves. And I pray, God, that you would save them, that you would conquer their rebellion and conquer their will. You would reveal to them their sin, that you would save them and show, yourselves might, show yourself mighty in their eyes. Hallow yourself in their eyes. Glorify yourself, God, in their salvation. Praise you, God, for your grace and your mercy in these things. I pray, God, for your people. God, that you would conquer every vestige of sin and rebellion. Conquer that wicked indifference and apathy that seems to rot and stink in our hearts. God, I pray that you would conquer the flesh. That you would drag us out of our sin, God, that you would conquer our selfish desires and our selfish motives and our selfish lusts for your namesake, God. God, I pray that you would conquer our laziness and conquer our apathy for your glory, God. I pray that by the strength that your spirit supplies, God, that through that strength we would put our sail into the wind, God, and that you would fill it with the means of grace and blow our boat toward glory. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for your goodness in this. We praise you and thank you for Christ, God, and we pray for your glory to be in all the earth as waters cover the sea. 